An ordinary dinner party, the sort of occasion we all enjoy. The men are exchanging witty stories. And look at the women, aren't they pretty? Look at the way they laugh, they're delightful. But now the conversation turns to more serious matters. I wonder if the government should return to the gold standard. I think it should. Good, then we're all agreed. But oh dear, what's this? One of the women is about to embarrass us all. I think the government should stay off the gold standard so that the pound can reach a level that will keep our exports competitive. The lady has foolishly attempted to join the conversation with a wild and dangerous opinion of her own. What half-baked drivel. See how the men look at her with utter contempt. There they were going home. <gasps> Women, know your limits. Is it Joseph Engels, very famous. Uh, I'm going to get the quote wrong, but he said about Darwin, he said, how strange that Darwin should look to the beasts and the and nature and see a replication of the society that he lives in. In the intro, we just heard extracts from an old fast show sketch and the voice of Lucy Cook, our sole guest for this podcast episode. Lucy is a zoologist, TV presenter and author of the book Bitch, which tells a wildly different story of reproduction, gender and sexual habits in the animal kingdom to that which has been passed down to us by Darwin, Dawkins and other highly influential male scientists. Bitch challenges outdated preconceptions and biases around the idea of the female of the species being sexually coy, monogamous and passive while the male is sexually dominant and promiscuous. Bitch also challenges broader beliefs around male and female roles and why binary models of the world and ourselves are increasingly being challenged. What's more, Lucy does all of this with great humour. I met up with her in a woodland in Sussex to talk birdsong, bonobos, same-sex parenting, sex-changing fish, menopausal whales, parthenogenesis and murderous meerkats. Trigger warning, this episode also contains discussions about vomit bubbles and sexual cannibalism. Yeah, yeah. Well, I spent the afternoon in Hastings, so... Yeah, did a bit of mooching around the old town. Very nice, nice, nice to, see to see you. Are you well? Yeah, yeah. I'm good. What's the name of the little guy? He's called Kobe. Kobe. Yeah. So we're in we're in Gasoline Wood on the outskirts of Hastings, which is Dazzle- ancient woodland. So I come here when I'm writing and just sort of sort of try and walk through ideas and think about things, you know. So it worked for Dickens. Me and Dickens, we've got a lot in common. <laughs> <laughs> So my name's Lucy Cook and I I am a writer, I suppose, these days mostly. Uh, uh, you know, write, I write books about, about animals and I'm particularly interested in how culture shapes science. I'm particularly interested in how we impose versions of ourselves onto the animal kingdom and use them as a reflection to bounce back at ourselves. And how did I come to do this? Oh my God, in a very long, circuitous route. I studied zoology at Oxford or I studied evolutionary biology, then I left and then I went to go and work in television. I got my first job was working for Jonathan Ross. I worked for Vic and Bob, I worked on The Far Show, I worked in comedy for years. Then I went to go and make documentaries. I wanted to make natural history documentaries that were funny, um, but nobody would commission them. So then I thought, oh, I'll just um, fuck off around South America looking for frogs because they're my favourite animal, that's what I really wanted to do. Um, and I was really worried about frogs at the time and and so I wrote a blog about that and then that blog was read by National Geographic who then offered me my own TV series which was really random and then I did that for a bit I was a telly presenter for a bit so then I started writing more and now I write books and who knows what's going to be next So the opening question has to be what was wrong with our view of male and female in the animal kingdom and our views on sexual reproduction and the dominance of the male. Well, what was, what was wrong was that it was, it was incredibly narrow-sighted and blinkered. There was a stereotype of what it meant to be female that was created in the Victorian era, basically by Charles Darwin, who was an absolutely brilliant scientist, you know, and, and incredibly meticulous and, and cautious, in fact, which is ironic. You know, he didn't publish on the origin of species for 
for decades because he was noodling away on barnacles to make sure that he got things right and he was yeah. a naturalist and he had the stripes in order to, you know, so he was a, he was a cautious man and, and, and a meticulous scientist, uh, which is even more surprising that he fell prey to cultural bias because when he came to writing The Descent of Man, and which defined his theory of sexual selection, which which explained the differences between the sexes, the female of the species came out in the shape of a Victorian housewife. <laughs> she was passive, coy, and submissive by default, you know, and it was the males who were the dominant drivers of evolutionary change. They were the ones who had all the fun. They were competitive, aggressive, promiscuous, and females were just a sort of feminine footnote to the macho main event. And the problem is, is because Darwin said that, it meant that Everybody that followed in his wake just viewed the world through his Victorian pinhole camera yeah. and failed to see the full Technicolor version of life, you know, which we're now, you know, still beginning, we're still piecing together basically because, um, because of, uh, you know, Darwin's stereotypes are so enduring. It is a fantastic um, piece of um, particularly damning evidence for his views of of, uh, of the fairer sex, which was his um, his list of pros and cons of whether to get married, um, and they include the cons were you know missing the conversation of clever men at clubs. Um, but um, a nice, and this is a direct quote, a nice soft wife on the sofa would be better than a dog anyhow, you know. Ouch. <laughs> you know, so in The Descent of Man, he does say man has ultimately become superior to woman as a result of sexual selection. So, but on the other hand, he allowed his daughter to edit his books. So... You know, he, he and, and, and you know, and he did, he did give females agency in that he he proposed the idea that the mechanisms of of, of sexual selection, which was this this other form of um, this other driver of evolutionary change, distinct to natural selection, which is a sort of utilitarian force, all about just survival and what you need to survive, and Ooh. and sexual selection is about the quest to get to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> basically and that is what's caused the, caused these sort of um ornaments of the peacock's tail to evolve these sort of fantastic or, or armaments which like the stag's antlers that they fight with well let's let's move from from darwin yeah. to Daw Kobe, come on. to dawkins because yeah. you talk about dawkins as well yeah. um in your book you know we're, we're talking about two of the most influential scientists aren't we of the last 150 years i think what did Dawkins write about the difference, differences between male and female and, and sexual reproduction in, in Selfish Gene? You know, in the 1970s, when he wrote The Selfish Gene, there was this new wave of, of, um, of science called sociobiology. And, and, it, and, it, and it was, and it really sort of, it, it, it gave Darwin's theory of sexual selection, which had laid dormant, for, for almost a century and being kind of ignored. It was sort of laughed out the house in the Victorian era. But um, it was revived in the 1970s and Dawkins in the, sel in the Selfish Gene very much and given a kind of like an empirical reboot by various different evolutionary, white male evolutionary biologists. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was taught by him at university and he was my he was my tutor at New College, and and I I remember being taught by him, you know, the the universal law, which is that sperm are cheap to produce and eggs are expensive, so males will be um, wired for profligacy. You know, they can spread their seed and splurge as much as they like because it's a completely cost-free um, exercise. And that's what they want to do. They want to just be as promiscuous as possible. That's their strategy. Females, on the other hand, with their, with their um, investment in their expensive eggs, what they want to do is be choosy and they're seeking chastity. You know, and, and, you know I remember being taught this and... Um, I'm thinking, well, I just I don't really understand how this works. Like, if all the males are being promiscuous and the females are being chased, then who are the males having sex with? You know, like, it just, like, mathematically, it didn't make any sense to me. And it just also just was wildly dispiriting as an 18-year-old to realise that you're an evolutionary loser. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, uh, but, yeah, so that's what I was taught. And, in fact, very famously in, in The Selfish Gene, he wrote... Um, 
the, the word excess has no meaning for a male. <laughs> but um, but uh, uh, unfortunately, his, um, his pronouncement was a little premature, perhaps, because it turns out that, you know, sperm aren't free. And there's all these, you know, compounds in semen that are really expensive to produce. Plus, there's the whole finding a mate. You know, I mean, we're in the woods now here. You probably could see squirrels. My dog's probably chasing some. Somebody did a study and actually worked out how much energy a male squirrel expends looking for a mate, which I just think is brilliant. Yeah. I just love these, <laughs> these things. Like, you know. and, uh, and they found out that it was exactly the same amount as, as a female spends on lactation. You know, so these things even up. You know, mm. it's not like males you know have suddenly you know somehow got this kind of like free energy budget that, that you know that they never have to dip into so you know there was this kind of rise of feminism in the 60s and 70s and then sociobiology came along and basically said well you know all you feminists can think what you like but Darwinian law says that males are meant to be dominant we're the promiscuous aggressive competitive ones and you're just a load of baby makers so shut up you know and so it got really embraced it was like this sort of amazing moment where I mean you know and also people like Dawkins are amazing popular science writers right I mean he's an incredibly skillful science communicator the selfish gene um, was a hugely successful book and so they they sort of bled into popular culture and kind of rubber stamped all of these sexist mm. ideas so you know it's like this sort of boomerang effect you know of what started in victorian culture was imprinted onto science and then bounces back onto popular culture 150 years later you know 100 odd years later let me get was it joseph engels very famous and i'm going to get the quote wrong but he said something he was a he he said about Darwin, he said, how strange that Darwin should look to the beasts and, the, and nature and see a replication of the society that he lives in. You know, and there are those, you know, Richard Levontin, Stephen Jay Gould, who were in the 1970s, when this sort of rise of sociobiology happened and the likes of Dawkins and, and Robert Trivers, um, and E.O. Wilson were, were proposing that these, these, these sort of sexist stereotypes were ingrained in nature. Um, you know, they, they sort of stood up and said, well, you know, is that not just sort of capitalism imprinted on, on the animal kingdom? You know, I'm fascinated by, by that idea, actually, how much, to what extent we have, we, we understand everything that we're walking amongst now through this patriarchal kind of western capitalist lens mm. you know you know the thing about nature is is that it's fantastically diverse and there's all sorts of systems that exist mm. and sure the dominant male and the submissive female are amongst those systems but they're not the only system out there and 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 you know darwin and dawkins they knew of other systems but they'd call them alternative but actually that's a you know that's that giving them a label of being alternative suggests that they're you know outside of the mainstream but that's not actually true you know the, the idea was that that the dominant mating system was polygyny and so you know every male would be mating with multiple females well and it's taken forever but it is now literally in the last couple of years scientific papers just start with it's now known that the dominant mating system is polygynandry it's it's m males and females mating with multiple partners because it's beneficial to mate with multiple mm. partners and it's not it's not just that males do it and they're the only ones that benefit from it females do it too you know um and in most cases in nature they're doing it to be good mums you know they're not doing it to be you know wanton um vixens or any amount of you know rude names that that, fem that you know the, the double standard has put on women who or females that you know are promiscuous but yeah yeah it it, it, it is it is changing but it's fascinating how long it's taking
there's a number of reasons why females mate with multiple males. Um, one of one of them is that it um, protects against infanticide. So that was it was Sarah Blafferhardy, who's an amazing scientist, who I was one of the first people I tracked down when I was researching my book. And she's now in her eighties, and she's just phenomenal. And um, you know, she was the one who realised that females would mate with multiple males because um, it, it's a sort of paternity confusion because often males are infanticidal but if the females mate with lots of males then they're less likely to kill babies if they've recently mated with a female because they might be theirs right mm. so you know there's that reason and then there's also you know that there's various different sort of compatibilities that that might only be discovered once the sperm is inside you and that and that that kind of get weeded out in the reproductive tract you know in some in one way or another so um so you're more likely to hit the genetic jackpot basically if you mate with lots of males you know why put all your eggs in one basket speaking of eggs one of the facts that really surprised me in lucy's book was that while the most recently evolved songbirds or passerines in europe and the u.s are most likely to be males globally 71% of all female songbirds sing, contrary to the widespread belief that singing is the exclusive domain of the male, who practices and practices to perfection in the hope of attracting a female partner. I mean, this one really was one of the ones that really kind of blew my mind and is such a great example of the bias because, you know, birdsong is one of those, you know, classic artefacts of sexual selection. You know, Darwin wrote about, you know, the male bird, songbird, you know, sings his heart out and and um, female chooses a male and then they build a nest together. And um, and so only and, and the males are singing to defend their t- territory and, and, and compete with other males and to attract the female. And the female has no need to sing. She just, in order to be a good mum, she can just be silent about it. And and so and that, so that's what everybody thought. The fact that that, that Darwin was wrong was discovered by um, some amazing Australian ornithologists because in Australia, all females, all female birds sing. So what they were saying is, is you know, had had Darwin been born down under. He would have known damn well that females sing, and you know he might have it might have really affected all of his studies if he'd you know. But but what happens is that the migratory songbirds they've lost the the the, the females don't sing because singing's expensive. You need a big brain to sing, and when you fly for a living, long distances in particular, every bit of energy counts. So you're not going to carry around a brain that remembers song on a long flight if you don't need it right Mm -hmm. um and what's happened with the migrating songbirds is that the males tend to arrive first in new territories set up territories and sing just like darwin said they do and then the females arrive and they're attracted to males with certain territories Um, but elsewhere in like the tropics or in australia they're not migrating they're both there year round and they're both using song for the same reasons. They're defending their territory either together or separately. And they're attracting mates that way as well, both males and females. So, you know, and yeah, and 71% of, of, of birds actually sing, you know, so it's 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 a lot, it's the majority. Um, Gail Patricelli, who's done a lot of work on, on female choice, um, has sort of decoded what's going on because the sort of the the, the the standard model is is that the male shows off in some way and then the female or they compete um and and the, the female is chosen by the winner or 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 chooses a, the a, a male that she likes right um but what gail patricelli found by use by making robot birds, which is just so brilliant. I went to go and visit her and, and drove around her robot birds in her in her lab. She's worked with sage grouse, but also bower birds is what she worked on right. first of all. So the males that build these extraordinary bowers. Um, she realised that the females they don't just automatically mate with the male that that they who has the most impressive bower. There's a dialogue going on and she's giving off subtle cues as to whether she's receptive or not. So he can't just steam in. If he just sort of steams in and she, she turns up at his bow, likes the look of it, and then he just steams in and tries to mate with her. She's like, fuck off, I'm not doing that, you know. Um, 
there's he basically he's got to listen he's got to, as well as being a show off he's got to listen so in those cases yes it's correct it is the male that's showing off and it's not the female in in those examples but the the story is much more complicated than we thought it was. Another long-held prejudice in evolutionary thinking was that the menopause was exclusive to humans. You know, it was always thought that humans were the only species which naturally went through the menopause and that, you know, it was occasionally it was reported that, you know, the odd primate in captivity would live beyond its reproductive shelf life as a result of being propped up by regular meals and, and, and medicine. And so it's sort of assumed that that human females must be the same. You know, we're meant to die out, in my case, literally now. Um, and, um, and then along came the orca and rescued us, basically, because they also naturally go through menopause and they have a post-reproductive life that's as long as their reproductive life. So they, 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 they go through menopause around about the same time in their, in their 40s and, 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 and 50s, and then they go on to live into their hundreds. And the interesting thing about their society is everybody assumed that orcas were um, male dominant because males are bigger than females and everybody always thinks that and the males are bigger than they must be in charge but it turns out it's not the it's not just females it's the pose these postmenopausal grannies that are the leaders of orca society and basically they they stop reproducing halfway through their life so that unlike the meerkat they're not competing with their relatives and they, they, they're, they're ducking out and they're investing their energy instead in their daughters and their and, and in their offspring and their offspring's offspring. Um, and also they, they live for a very long time um, and they become the, you know, basically the repositories for ecological wisdom that keep their hunting, cultured hunting community alive. Um, and um, they're amazingly clever. And... Um, yeah, it's these sort of wise old lady whales that, that become the, the, the leaders of their society. Lucy's book is packed with entertaining examples of the true diversity of the sexual predilections and evolutionary wonders amongst the female of the species, ranging from insects and arachnids to apes and whales. As we continued our wander around the ancient woodland with Kobe, I began by asking Lucy about moles. Yeah, so the most, um, being a mole is hard work. You've got to live underground, catch worms for a living. Um, evolution's given the mole some, oh, Kobe, just, oh, God. Oh, I'm going to start again. So, yeah, m m moles. I'm that. <laughs> <laughs> it's my dog jumping up and putting mud all over me. Yeah, so the amazing thing about moles is uh, uh, the, the, the female basically has balls. Her gonads are internal but they are part ovary and part testicular tissue. And, and this is an amazing thing. So they're called ovotestes and she produces a shit ton of testosterone. They don't produce sperm. During the breeding season, she produces eggs. And then outside of that, she produces um, tons of testosterone. And as a result, she has genitalia that are basically indistinguishable from, from males. So, uh, you know, so many of the bitches in bitch really challenge sort of traditional binary definitions of of uh, or expectations i should say binary expectations of of genitals and gonads you know and and, and the mole is is one of them it's one d and the she's in the garden just there you know mm. digging away with the big balls Yeah, so the Laysan albatross, there's a, there's a colony in Hawaii that have been studied for like 50 years. There was this mystery because albatross are sort of socially monogamous and they lay one egg because it's a huge expense for the female and you need two parents in order to raise the chick because it's like it takes six months to fledge. But there was this anomaly that there were there were a bunch of nests that had two eggs and they never nobody knew why. Lots of weird excuses given. And then eventually, um, Lindsay um, Young, who studies the albatross, said, "Well, has anybody actually checked that they're male and female? Because male and female are identical." And um, nobody had. So she took further samples from every single nest and found that a third of this of the couples in this colony were female female couples. And basically, there's a shortage of males. 
so the females, in order to, uh, they're mating with other albatross husbands and, uh, and then shacking up with the female in order to raise the chicks. So they'll both lay an egg, hence the double clutches. And one of those won't survive, which is quite random, which one doesn't. Um, but they're managing to raise one chick every two years, you know, or, you know, one chick between two rather than none, you know. So um, it's, 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 it just, it gets another example of how plastic all of these traits are sex roles, sexuality, and, and sexuality because the couples they behave just like the heterosexual couples. So they do all the same preening and 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 and, and nuzzling that sort of releases all the bird oxytocin. They mount one another, um, and 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 some of these couples, you know, just last one season, and some of them are really enduring. Like there was this one couple that I met there of birds that had been together seventeen years, and they'd had eight chicks and three grand chicks together, you know, and their relationship just worked. Let's look at some particular ideas w really outside of, of our heteronormative narrative. So mm. parthenogenesis mm. in animals, you write about geckos. Yeah, yeah, this was brilliant because I didn't realise that, so parthenogenesis, I think from the Greek meaning virgin birth, it's um, asexual reproduction basically. So they are all female societies that, 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 lay, that, that, that don't need males in order to reproduce and they can reproduce solely by cloning. And I thought that before I started researching this book, I thought that, that they were all sort of microscopic creatures. There were lots of you know, asexual, single-celled creatures out there. I didn't realise there was there were vertebrates that that um, that had dispensed with males, basically. So, in the case of the morning gecko, Leptodactylus lugubris, which I met on on the island of Hawaii, they evolved from a, a, a species that was sexually reproducing, where there were males, and then they basically their bodies, you know, they evolved to cheats the process of, of meiosis, where, of forming sex cells, so that they don't need sperm to fertilise them and they can basically um, combine and, and, and fertilise themselves effectively and, and, and so they can, they can clone themselves. Um, and as a result, they're wildly successful because they can proliferate at twice the rate of sexually reproducing species. So, I mean, um, lots of species, like aphids, for example, they switch between sexual and asexual reproduction. Um, but in and, and it turns out that there are quite a few vertebrates that can do that too. So Leptodactylus lugubris has totally dispensed with males. But um, <laughs> this is such a brilliant thing. But there was in, I think it was like in Nebra an aquarium in Nebraska, there was a shark in a tank in, an, in, in this aquarium with a couple of rays. And it had been in there for like five years or something. And then one day just randomly it gave birth. And everybody was like, that's a virgin birth like how did that happen hail the lord you know and everybody's looking at the rays they're like we didn't do nothing mate you know we're the wrong species we're not into any of that kind of nonsense and um so they didn't know what was going on and she just spontaneously cloned herself so it, it seems that there's a latent ability in in some um fish and bird species for them to be able to clone themselves when there are no males around maybe more common than we think. And it's kind of like, a, and so it's quite sad because we're finding like the sawfish, for example, has been found to be doing it in the wild because everybody's killed all the sawfishes and so the females have got nobody to mate with. But it's a, yeah, it's a last ditch resort to um, strategy to, to there being no males to reproduce with. So there was about 500 species of fish that changed sex. Um, famously, the, the clownfish, which is famous from Finding Nemo, when little Nemo, you know the story, little Nemo found, found lost, lost his mum and uh, went on a big adventure to find his dad. Well, if, if, if Finding Nemo was a real um, movie, it would have a very different ending because what happens is if, if a, a, a female is, is 
taken by a barracuda, then the male that she was mating with transforms into being the dominant female and one of the immature males, aka the son, <laughs> becomes the new sexual partner. So it's it's a, it's a you know it's it's a different it's a different story to the one that was in the the, the movie. But um, so Nemo would have shagged his sex should, changed dad. He would have shagged his sex changed dad. Yeah, I exactly. See that yeah. Movie. <laughs> Disney wouldn't make that, would they? They wouldn't make that movie. No, exactly. <laughs> but um, but you know, it, what's really fascinating about that is Justin Rhodes, who studies um, that change in the in the clownfish. Um, he's seen that what happens is is almost immediately the fish. The male who's who's um, transforming into a female or it's you know left behind, he 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 starts behaving as a female and is recognised by females. But his gonads take up to a year to change from testes to ovaries. So you know Justin's got this lab full of fish and he had one fish. You know and he's like this fish is mid change. Now so what sex is that fish? And he goes good question. He said because science would tell you the biological sex of that fish is male because it still has testes. But every, all the fish, including that fish, would tell you it's female. So, you know, what he was saying is that in that fish, gender identity is separate from biological sex. So you can see how these things are independently regulated. Mm. Um, and it might just be that it is only in that fish that that's the case, or it might be that... that that it is as we see amongst our own species that gender identity and biological sex are, are uncoupled and they don't follow in a linear fashion necessarily. OK, I've written down, let's discuss sexual cannibalism, copulatory suicide and spiders. Um, and you, the chapter on spiders made me feel physically sick, <laughs> uh, I have to say. I, d I don't like spiders at the best of times. Uh, and the descriptions of, you know, the, those poor males trying to avoid being impaled was um, it was truly horrific before i started writing this book i didn't even realize quite what sort of um um terrifying um sexual predators that spiders are i also didn't know that if you see a spider in a web that's most likely a female because the females are much much bigger than the males sometimes by hundreds of factors you know they're, they're they're like way bigger than the males they've got to get nice and fat because they want they're they're going to make these expensive eggs right so 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 they're much much they're, they're much much bigger and they are the ones that spin the webs and they do all the hunting because they've got to catch lots of food to fatten themselves up so they're ready to make lots of eggs the males on the other hand are basically walking sacks of sperm they often don't have fangs they might not have venom they don't need to spin webs some of them don't even eat you know they're just going to try and inseminate a female that's that's their that's all they're that's all they're going to try and do and they live much shorter lives as a result extremely short if they try and um copulate with a female who's hungry and um she may well eat them before during or, or after sex during yeah, during. I mean, I spoke to, um, I can't remember his surname now, Dave. I can't remember Dave's surname. But anyway, he works at the Zoological Society of London. And he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And he has this job where he has to try and get the, the spiders to conserve species. I think it was the fenwater spider that... Um, that um, is this sort of, you know, sexual cannibal. And, you know, he sort of introduces the males into the mating arena and he's like, go on, guys, let's hope you're going to make it. You know, and then, you know, one by one, the, the suitors get demolished by her fangs and uh, and, and gobbled up. And, and, and you know, and he, he's, he, it's very sweet because he sort of really feels for them and, you know, he really wants to conserve the species and it's really important that, that the males can actually mate with the females, you know, in order to do that. And uh, he, he, he was amazed though that the that the males even though they get eaten they're actually really quick at mating you know they've got very quick draw you know and actually even it looks like that they've not managed to to actually fertilize the female but even though they've been eaten during sex they've actually still managed to do that you know which is you know that's commendable yeah, it's commendable yeah. behavior isn't it i mean you know like talk about being put off your stroke you know like you're actually being munched at the same time <laughs> It's clearly, it's horrifying for men, right? The whole idea of it. And Darwin w was also horrified by it. And he, there's these sort of brilliant letters sent to him by various sort of gentlemen naturalists saying, well, I think I saw this female consuming a male, you know, and he was so tiny. And, you know, like they're just completely, like, like the whole order of the world has been reversed. What the hell is going on, you know? 
But actually, it's just an extreme form of parental care. You know, the male's nourishing the eggs that he's fertilizing, basically, or hopefully fertilizing, um, with his own body. You know, I mean, there's plenty of males that will offer what's called nuptial gifts to females, um, you know, and they're often sort of gloopy lumps of sperm or, or vomit bubbles or things like that, you know. And this is just nice. the kind of, yeah, lovely. I mean, you know, insects, they really know how to do romance, you know. Um, and, <laughs> but, um, you know, so so in this case, it's just that it's 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 the actual male. And there was this, there's this brilliant... Um, scientists um, who did this study and found that if if you feed a female um, a male or an equivalent amount of nutritious crickets her, her eggs grow faster and she has more hatchlings that last for longer with the male of her species suggesting that there's something uniquely nutritious about this sort of bespoke spider making dinner that is made of spider to create other little spiders mm -hmm. and you know so so when you think about it that in that cold-hearted way i don't know if that helps you but no it doesn't <laughs> um but but i remember i remember there was certain tactics on there mm. and they've got like distraction tactics where they yeah. might they might sort of throw a bit of food or or sort of go oh look at that over there is that right yeah yeah so i mean the, the male has the real misfortune that you know he basically he looks like lunch you know so and 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 so he's got to kind of both get her attention by behaving like an insect, but then also very quickly, you know, mate with her before she actually eats him. And then they have various different tactics of how to stop the eating bit happening. So, you know, they're into, and, they, and, they, and I mean, it's it's like a sort of, you know, 50 shades of grey, you know, there's like this spider bondage, they use silk, they'll tie up the female and then, you know, try and stop her from grabbing them. They'll, they'll come along with a little, with a gift, perhaps a, um, a, a wrapped up fly in silk. Some of them have like bogus gifts that they just bring silk with no fly inside. I mean, can you imagine the rage afterwards? Um, but yeah, I, 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 it, I mean, evolution, that's why I love it. It's so inventive and it's, it's, you know, it's actually very comic and endearing as well. And what could be more endearing than meerkats? They're so sweet. They huddle together in this cute way and, and they stand up. They're also really cute. In fact, they've got very cute faces. And we even trust them to help us find the best online deals. Compare the meerkats dot symbols. So there was a survey that was done looking at a thousand different mammal species, at which species, which ones were most likely to be murdered by, killed by a member of their own species. And amazingly, humans came number two, meerkats came out number one, um, because meerkat society is um, predicated on ruthless competition between females who you have a dominant female and she doesn't want any of the other females her sisters reproducing if they do she'll kill and possibly eat their babies now it's not something you saw on meerkat manor but that's what actually happens and so every meerkat has a one in five chance of being killed um, by a member of its own species most likely its own mother or sister so yeah i mean i i don't know how they made it to be sort of wholesome tea time entertainment but um because they look cute they look cute, but their society is br is tense and homicidal, basically. So I've written down, ask about the Bateman paradigm which I don't remember now um, and why does why isn't it taught in Oxford does that make sense well, do you know what I was just in Oxford on Monday yeah because I was the students wrote to me and asked me to come and give a lecture about Bateman's paradigm and right. because they're not being they're still being taught these androcentric stereo paradigms basically and it's Bateman's paradigm was this sort of 1940s experiment using mutant fruit flies from this British plant geneticist, which basically provided empirical evidence for Darwin's sexual stereotypes, that males would um, have everything to gain from mating with multiple females and females had nothing to gain from it. You know, basically this amazing woman that I spoke to a lot, Patricia Goati, who's an incredible scientist, who's also a feminist, she 
was suspicious of the science behind this 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 Bateman's experiment from the 1940s which you know has a lot to answer for because it's it's the the evidence that supports all these ideas right so she went back and she tried to replicate Bateman's experiments she even went back to Bateman's original notes and basically she found out that they were statistically manipulated that the methodology was flawed and that you know Bateman's results weren't supported by by Bateman's you know findings it was like it was an empirical nonsense in fact when I asked her to describe Bateman's work in one one word she said cluster fuck <laughs> <laughs> which is obviously a highly technical term and uh, that maybe your audience are not going to be familiar with but it's a load of it's just a statistical sleight of hand that that created this graph that is then replicated in every single textbook you know to support these stereotypes you know and and so if the stereo- if, sorry to, and to ask you again so the, the stereotypes stereoty- being oh. of, of males being um, more varied being competitive being more promiscuous and females having nothing to gain from mating with multiple males so females are not as varied and they don't mate you know promiscuously they've nothing to gain from that you know Science is replication. If you can't replicate results, you know, and you go back to the notes and you see that they've been, you know, they've been fudged, then, you know, you should pay attention to that. But but, um, people love these stereotypes and so the people are wedded to these ideas. And, you know, Oxford is one of those places where they've been very slow to tell a different story. And when I ask them if they teach... Patty's papers alongside, you know, when they teach Bateman's paradigm, um, they said, no, they're they're considered too political. They're um, considered political perspectives. You know, yes, Patty is a feminist, but her science is solid, you know? She's wearing her ideology out there. You can see it, you know, whereas Darwin's wasn't. You know, we're all, all scientists have ideologies, you know, like nobody exists in a vacuum. We all see the world through the prism of our own existence, you know, and that imprints how we interpret the world, you know. And I think the only thing you can do is to be honest and humble about that. Good morning, Dr. Zero. Good morning, Julius. How's our patient today? No change. Well, bright eyes. Is our throat feeling better? Still hurts, doesn't it? That bright eyes is remarkable. He keeps trying to form words. You know what they say. Human see, human do. I think it's really ingrained the idea that patriarchy is burnt into our DNA, you know, and we have the chimpanzee to thank for that because models of human ancestry were always based on chimpanzees and pe- chimpanzee society is patriarchal and warlike. But thankfully, along came the bonobo and the bonobo society, we now know, is matriarchal and peaceful. Um, and what's interesting about that is the females are able to... Um, dominate the males even though they're smaller than the males so the males could in theory physically dominate them they don't because the females have formed a very strong um, sisterhood with one another but they're not related because the females are the dispersing sex that 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 leave the, the the troop that they're born in so when they join a troop they make friends with other females by having sex with each other so that dampens the aggression Mm. and 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 mix and form bonds you know and um and so they form this this very powerful unrelated sisterhood that resists um male coercion and and dominance and 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 they are that they are the dominant sex and they they have a you know they mean they they have a lot of sex the males have a lot of sex the males are having you know there's a lot of sex that goes on with bonobos famously um but um, basically, um, you could say that the females um, managed to overthrow the patriarchy through ecstatic same-sex frottage. So, you know, which is one way of doing it. <laughs> what are we waiting for? <laughs> now, how's your bum? My bum? I just I mean... That was... Uh... <laughs> I meant sit, sitting here. That was that was ill timed. It, it was ill timed, but I, I mean, I, I I look forward to the listeners writing in and wondering what 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 it was that, that prompted that question. But yeah, my bottom's fine. We are sitting on an uncomfortable log, and so I could move. Sure, I'm also yes. my dog would like to move. Otherwise, I'm yeah. worried that he's going to continue to jump off the trousers.
do you feel more comfortable thinking in, of nature as being non-binary now? Yeah, absolutely. I think the thing is, is when you when you understand, uh, well, when you can see the plastic nature of sex within the animal kingdom. You know, you have creatures that, you know, they are, their sexual determination isn't genetic, it's, it's environmental. It might be a social cue that, 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 that triggers the male or female pathway. And, and, um, and, and, you know, you have creatures that change from one sex to, sex to another and you have creatures that remain pretty much on the fence, you know, for a lot of their lives until something happens that pushes them one way or the other. So you can see that actually... It's incredibly plastic, and basically we're, we're made of the same genes, the same hormones, and and I think that 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 and and when you understand how sexual determination happens and how kind of leaky that process is, it, it throws up a lot of variation. I mean, hence the mole, right? You know that that the mole has these fantastic flexible gonads because of the one sort of tweak in her her, her and her genes that that um that allow for that and so variation is the grit that drives evolution forward everything is normal you know it's all normal it's all normal when you see the context of what comes out of of all these wondrous um forms of variation we need that variation if we didn't have variation we'd cease to evolve it, it's complicated and you know sexuality sexual identity um, sex behaviours, they're all highly plastic, you know, and they're all movable parts. You know, culture has seen sex as a binary thing, but it just isn't, you know, and so we're in this difficult position right now where we're sort of trying to put a square peg in a round hole because that's where it belongs. But mm. we understand, you know, now that it's just more complicated. And I think we will get through this period, you know, but it's going to be bumpy. But it's bumpy, yeah. What should listeners take away from this? I think they should feel liberated from the restraints of Victorian thinking and to realise that the natural world is a fantastically diverse place and that, that, that variation is at the heart of that and it's what allows evolution to create extraordinary creatures like the mole or, you know, the anemone fish or the bonobo or, or the hyena or indeed the chimpanzee male. You know, there's, there's all sorts of ways of being. There's all sorts of systems and sex is no crystal ball. It, it doesn't define how males and females should behave or, or be or the bodies that they should have or the brains that they should have. And challenge the heteronormative narrative if it's presented as being the right, the natural, the normal way of, of looking at the world. Absolutely. I think that, you know, the idea that, that sex is just about reproduction is a very Victorian thing. And then, you know, you see how much same-sex sexual activity goes on amongst the animal kingdom. I mean, you know, there's myriad ways of being, basically. Yeah. Adventures in Utopia was produced and presented by me, David Bramwell, with music from Oddfellows Casino. For more info, go to drbramwell.com or contact me on Twitter at Dr. Bramwell. Huge thanks to all of my guests in this episode and for the support of Hawkwood College. The idea of Newtopia was established by John and Yoko in 1973 as a place with no boundaries and whose international anthem is silence. Gratitude and support to our friends at Journey to Newtopia for their role in our provenance. This podcast was made possible by the generous sponsorship of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids. You can tell a lot about a podcast from the folk who choose to sponsor it. Our rival podcast, The Nemesis, Escapades in Futuropia, stupid name, may have bigger budgets and more competent presenters and better guests, but let's not forget that they're sponsored by oil magnates, dictators, tyrants and companies who make penny whistles for small children. This podcast series is sponsored by an ecological and spiritual organisation dedicated to teaching students about the Eightfold Wheel of the Year, rituals, self-development and the magical properties of trees, plants, animals and the earth. Home learning courses in six different languages present Druidry in an accessible, direct way with online and postal learning and a team of over 50 mentors and 200 groups around the world. So you really don't need to live near Stonehenge to participate. Find out more at druidry.org.